Hello everyone and welcome to the launch of the Lowy Institute Indonesia poll. My name is Ben Bland and I'm the director of the Southeast Asia program here at the Lowy Institute. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today is a day of mixed emotions for me personally. I'm really delighted to be launching our new poll of Indonesian attitudes to the world, the first time we've done this in a decade. But I'm also sad because this is actually my last Lowy Institute event. Next month, I'm gonna be heading back to London to join Chatham House as the head of their Asia Pacific program. And I'm looking forward to continuing my work on Indonesia and Southeast Asia from my new old home. Now onto today's main event. And I'm really pleased to be joined by the co-authors of our Indonesia poll, uh, Natasha Kassam and Evan Laxmana, as well as the top Indonesian foreign policy analyst, Lina Alexandra. So Natasha, my colleague, is the director of the Public Opinion and Foreign Policy Program here at the Lowy Institute. Evan is a senior research fellow with the Center on Asia and Globalization at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. And Lina joins us from Jakarta, from, and she is the head of the Department of International Relations at the Center for Strategic and International Studies CSIS. So as Indonesia seeks to play a larger role on the global stage and an increasing number of outside powers try to woo Indonesia, I think there's a pressing need to better understand how Indonesians themselves see the world. And I think our poll offers some fascinating insights. So do check out all the results online, which are there in interactive and PDF format. And we really want to make this a um, an engaging discussion today. So do send us your questions through the Q&A function on Zoom, and we're gonna spare a lot of time at the end for your questions. Um, but first I wanna to come to Natasha, who runs the polling program at Lowy and has a lot of experience polling in Australia, and Lowy has run polls in other countries around the world before too. So Natasha, I wanna ask about why we did this poll. Uh, many analysts would say that foreign policy is ultimately an elite pastime and that public attitudes aren't really that relevant. So why do you think it's important to ask the Indonesian people how they feel about the world? Well, thanks so much, Ben, and thanks so much for working with me on this project and to Evan as well. Uh, I'm really thrilled that we were able to get it over the line before you leave us. A lot of people will say that foreign policy is the domain of elites, that, you know, in Australia, it's held by this tight circle in Canberra, in Jakarta, it's the same story. And really, you hear the same thing over and over again, uh, no matter what country you're in. You know, what would your average person know about the, the issues of foreign policy? How informed could they possibly be? You know, I push back strongly to that sentiment. I think that public opinion, regardless of whether it's about domestic or foreign policy, is incredibly important because they are the voters, they are the people who decide what are the parameters of policy that is available to their government. It's even important in authoritarian countries where perhaps they don't vote, but there is at least on some level accountability to the government and the government needs to be seen to responding to the public. Now, I'm not suggesting that governments can't use public opinion for their own nefarious purposes and that they can't shift it in certain ways. There's obviously back and forth here. But ultimately, I believe that we have a responsibility to understand what people think and to have that inform policy and where we do identify a lack of awareness. There is a responsibility on behalf of the government, academics, think tanks and other institutions to raise awareness in the community. We live in very interesting and confusing and at sometimes dangerous times. I think that there is a real need for more engagement and I think people really do want to know and they do really care. So that's why I'm really committed to this kind of work, committed to feeding these views into various capitals and I hope that they take them seriously. Thank, thanks for that, Tash. Now, I just want to come back to you quickly on kind of the structure of how we organize this poll, because increasingly elsewhere in the world, we see online polls becoming more and more popular. I think they're a lot cheaper generally and easier to do. Uh, but we conducted this poll face to face across 33 of Indonesia's 34 provinces. Uh, sorry to the people of, of North Kalimantan, uh, 3000 people. Why is it important in Indonesia to go face to face? And how confident can we be that these results are actually representative of public opinion in Indonesia? 
Well, in a, in a way, you've answered your own question. You know, the reason we have that confidence in our results is because of the methods that we use. We do apply a very high level of regard to our polls. And that is one of the reasons why we refuse to do exclusively online polls, because they simply can't reach a broad enough sample of the population. They can't have the random selection that we're looking for, for that high quality of response. So the way we did this was 3000 Indonesians between 18 and 65 were interviewed and they were interviewed face to face. And we used stratified random door-to-door -door sampling. I, I won't get into the details, but essentially these interviews were up to about 40 minutes with you know, a professional interviewer ensuring that they were getting the responses to the questions that the people met. Now, I do think that face-to-face -face surveys continue to be the most reliable means of achieving accurate samples in Indonesia. There's a question of internet access. There's questions of phone access. It's a large and dispersed population. Uh, you know, different methods are being used in different countries now. In Australia, we're using a mix of online and telephone sampling because face-to-face -face is no longer viable in terms of the costs involved. But where it is viable, it's still achieving a really high quality sample, particularly because we put in place quotas for each province, for age groups and for gender. So we really do feel confident that we have a good sample that includes both rural and urban residents of Indonesia. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tash. Um, Evan, I want to come to you next. Um, and I guess explain a bit of the context of when we did this poll. It was mostly conducted in, in December and really in, you know, the mid, in between two pandemic waves, I guess, in Indonesia, but really in the midst of a global pandemic, which has hit Indonesia pretty hard. Indonesia is also in the first recession it suffered since the Asian financial crisis of 1998. And we also at a time of intensifying global competition between great powers that's obviously been pretty apparent across uh, the Asian region. But what strikes me despite this climate is how confident Indonesians feel about the direction of their country, about how optimistic they are about the direction of their economy and how safe they feel. And on all these measures, Indonesians are basically feeling much more optimistic than a decade ago when we last did this survey and even more so than the previous survey in 2006. So Evan, do you think that Indonesians are right to have such a rosy outlook on the world at this time? I think uh, it's certainly uh, noteworthy that uh, in the midst of global pandemic, intensing um, a global rivalry, that we are more optimistic. But if we look at the polls as a whole and not the individual questions, and you start to see a different picture, which is maybe, just maybe, that optimism may not be fully warranted uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, I think Indonesians in general are less internationalized or plugged in uh, to the outside world as we would like to uh, in terms of travel. Of course, as you said, because of the pandemic, international travel um, uh, is small, but in general, I think uh, the lack of international travel um, is a serious issue uh, regarding exposure. Uh, secondly, we also asked the question of how closely do you follow international events? Um, and actually uh, about 17% suggest they somewhat uh, closely or very closely. And that tells me that most of Indonesians are not exactly uh, tune in to what's going on on the outside world uh, from an objective standpoint. And if you look at our other questions, which is how do you get your sources of information, you see that authority figures like the president, like the military, actually uh, is seen as the top more trusted uh, sources of information. So what Indonesians get in terms of a sense of optimism is, uh, for me, somewhat like an echo chamber. It's what the elites tell them to. Uh, and not based on their own objective assessment independently of what the elites tell them. So for me, this sense of, um, of optimism and self-confidence is certainly uh, seen as a positive thing, but do we really have strong warranted grounds for that optimism uh, when a lot of uh, uh, the information that you get, your, your exposure to the outside world is, is also very limited and hardly independent uh, from what the elites like to tell us. So for me, uh, I think uh, this is where we are right now. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Evan. I, I mean, I know from our many discussions over the last year when we've been in, in the weeds of this, we probably take, have a slightly different stance here where I, I tend to think, obviously, there's a synergy between public opinion and kind of elite political opinion on, on any issue and, and including foreign policy. But I tend to think that public opinion drives how the elites act as much as the other way around. But we're going to get into the weeds of some of these discussions um, in a bit. Uh, which is going to be interesting, but I want to come to you next, Lena. Um, you, you're, an, you're an outsider, you weren't involved in this project, but you're a, a longtime observer of Indonesia's place in the world um, and how Indonesians feel about the world. So I'm wondering 
What surprised you most uh, in this poll? Well, I think there are three things. The first thing is really uh, the result that is actually people in Indonesia are actually in favor with the Arabic prince, the MBS, the MBZ. Uh, that's, in, that's very interesting. Uh, but in my analysis, it's not really related to religious um, reason, but rather because the media has been covering news that these prints are quite, ge uh, quite generous in terms of uh, investing in Indonesia. So it's probably uh, more likely related to uh, economic um, rationale, because as you see in the poll as well, uh, the issue of job security, the issue of um, economic, um, the need to overcome the economic um, crisis, economic needs, uh, that's still the most priority issue for the Indonesian public. Uh, the second um, thing if I could is... just jump in very quickly, just just explain sure. to, our, to our viewers, you haven't read the survey yet. So the, the data that you're referring to was when we asked which global leaders Indonesians have the most confidence in. And actually, the person who came out top was Indonesia's own president, Joko Widodo. Uh, he was far and away uh, you know, at the top. And then the, the top most uh, trusted foreign leaders were, as you said, uh, MBS of uh, Saudi Arabia and MBZ of the UAE. So I just, just wanted to clarify that for people who haven't, haven't read, but yeah, sorry to interrupt and back to you. No worries, uh, Ben. Second thing is uh, the better perception toward the neighboring countries. I remember a decade ago, uh, the perception against the neighboring countries is quite, um, quite negative in the sense that we are quite worrying about uh, our neighboring countries, especially like Malaysia and, and Singapore. But in this poll, it's a lot much better from 63% uh, um, um, into 23% uh, of um, um, like in terms of um, um, uh, distrust. So uh, like the trust is, is getting higher actually uh, to, to these um, neighboring countries. Uh, I sense this probably uh, because of the last incidents in terms of Indonesian migrant workers in Malaysia and also less cultural incidences uh, between the two countries. The third thing that uh, uh, quite stuck me the most is uh, the fact that the, the, the polling says that um, the, the government or Indonesia should uh, act to become more an aid provider. Uh, that's quite interesting because uh, I think a decade ago when you ask the people, uh, they will say, um, I think it's better to satisfy the domestic needs first rather than being an aid provider. Um, I think uh, that's the three most um, quite um, interesting finding that I find that I find from the poll. Thanks. And, and I think that last uh, point you make will be interesting for the Indonesian government, which has launched its own aid agency in the last couple of years, and it's in the, the early stages of, of starting to look for its first project. So I think yeah, it's interesting to see that there's a, a degree of, of support for that. Um, I want to come next to the question of democracy, because right now in our world, we see a lot of talk about democracy back in the West uh, because of a lot of unity in opposition to, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And one, one thing that struck me about the results of our poll is that Indonesians really value their own democracy. Uh, I think something like 60% of Indonesians say that democracy is, is the best system, and that's almost unchanged from a decade ago. But importantly, when we asked Indonesians where they see their place in the world, uh, I think around 90% said that being part of the democratic world was really important to their sense of self-identity. But at the same time, when we asked which leaders and countries people have confidence in and, and trust, uh, the question that where MBS and MBZ came out very well, what we find is that Indonesians don't use democracy as a barometer by which to assess other countries and leaders. And that's quite different from, I think, polling data in Australia and elsewhere in the Western world, where generally people in liberal Western liberal democracies like other Western liberal democratic leaders. Um, so Evan, what, what do you think is going on here? I mean, what explains the fact that Indonesians see themselves as, as democratic and that's important to them, um, but they don't really see it as a useful way to kind of divide up the world or, or measure trust in other countries and leaders? Well, there's a couple of uh, potential interpretations there. But first of all, I think it, it needs to be acknowledged up front that a poll of this size uh, involving multiple questions uh, will not always be 100% coherent. There will be contradictions uh, here and there. So I think uh, that uh, needs to be said. Uh, secondly, I think what's interesting is that if you look at the poll collectively, and Lina mentioned earlier about how we still prioritize economic 
um, limited benefits rather than you know a global order and all that i think that tells us also that the indonesian public are much more pragmatic in terms of their measurement of what is influence of what is good what is bad what is priority and in this case i think the key measurement for of acknowledgement of understanding of trust and even favorability may have to do with economic uh, profile and engagement rather than whether or not uh, that country is democracy or not secondly i think despite indonesia's uh, a strong support for democracy for our own uh, political system we're not really necessarily instinctively in the habit of exporting that uh, voice of democracy yes we have the bali democracy forum but that's more as a lesson sharing platform so we're not uh, uh, super excited in general to measure other countries based on their democracies because we don't like it when people measure our democracy and mostly because I think deep down, we also realize that our own democracy is flawed somehow. So it will be a mistake to measure other countries' um, democratic performance or, or, or quality and, and then assess uh, trust. I think we are much more interested in assessing trust based on behavior. Are they seen as seemingly uh, contradictory to Indonesia's interests, for example, in terms of fisheries in the Natuna? Are they investing in Indonesia? Do they invest a lot? Do we trade a lot? Do we travel to see each other a lot? That I think for me is a much stronger measurement of how we assess regional trust as well as uh, their leaders. And I, I wanna take this um, in the direction of Russia and Ukraine a bit. And to be clear, our poll was done in, in December. So before the invasion, uh, but it's interesting to me that Vladimir Putin, the Russian leader and, and Russia you know, come out of this sort of somewhere in the middle. Uh, you know, Indonesians um, aren't very hostile. And actually, uh, I think it's, it's interesting to note that, that Scott Morrison, uh, Indonesians have uh, less confidence in him uh, than they do in Vladimir Putin. Although I think the data also shows that there's probably more name recognition uh, for Putin compared, compared to Morrison. So that might be playing a factor. But I just want to ask a more general question, not related to the poll, um, but, but maybe this is for you, Lena. I mean, what explains Indonesia's response at an elite level and, and maybe even in terms of public opinion to Russia's invasion of Ukraine? I mean, we've seen uh, the Indonesian government sign on to the UN General Assembly resolution condemning the invasion. Um, but the government's own commentary from the president and from the foreign ministry has been pretty restrained. Uh, we haven't seen Indonesia take a strong position against the invasion in the way that Singapore, its neighbor, has. Um, so why, why has Indonesia been so quiet, given that the Indonesian government itself often talks about wanting to have a greater role in world affairs and be a peacemaker? Here you have you know, one country clearly invading another, violating their sovereignty, committing war crimes now. Why do you think the government's been pretty restrained in its public commentary? I think in uh, to certain extent, Indonesia is very aware that this is a very complex issue compared to the 2014 for example, uh, when Russia uh, attacked the Crimean um, Peninsula at that time. So I think uh, because, especially because Indonesia is the current chair of G20 and there's certainly strong interest uh, for the G20 agenda not to be diverted um, into other agenda, especially um, becoming a battleground to talk about this crisis between U Russia and, and Ukraine. So uh, this crisis comes kind of a, uh, uh, a kind of a surprise for the Indonesian um, government, the Indonesian elite to some extent. And the other hand, on the other hand also, we also see in the social media quite a kind of um, strong uh, support uh, to the Russia policy uh, against um, Ukraine. Um, to some extent, um, I don't really know how to make sense of all this because uh, some uh, segment of the society, they try to link this with the Russian support to the Palestine, you know, turning it into uh, kind of a religious conflict, things like that, which doesn't really make sense for me. But I think to some extent, the government might monitor this kind of a trend uh, among the majority. That's why they are quite cautious to make certain moves. But at the end of the day, we know the pressure is getting higher. You know, uh, some countries are already threatening that they won't come to the summit uh, if the Russia is there. So that creates a, like a larger and bigger pressure for Indonesia as the chair. I think this is something that Indonesia need to face. And Evan, do you think this is something that has the potential to affect Australia-Indonesia relations? 
because we know, I think that Scott Morrison is among the leaders who's, who said that, that Putin shouldn't be at the G20 summit. We know that Jokowi himself as a leader generally doesn't like formal summits. He hasn't gone in person to the UN General Assembly. He, he doesn't really like the formality of ASEAN meetings. But the one um, sort of event he likes is G20 because it is informal. It is framed around the economy and investment, which are the things that he really cares about and focuses on. So do you think this issue, uh, if Australia and other Western countries continue to push for Putin not to be there or threaten to boycott if he is there, does it have the potential to disrupt Australia-Indonesia relations, which otherwise I'd have to say are probably, you know, in the best shape they've been for quite a long time? Yeah, I think the short answer is yes, it has the potential, uh, but we cannot just measure it based on this particular issue of, of Russia's aggression to, the Ukra uh, to Ukraine. Uh, I think in general, when it comes to Indonesia-Australia relations, when it comes to bilateral side of things, whether it's uh, free trade agreement, security cooperation, uh, people to people education, everything is running top notch, right? I think uh, bilaterally things uh, between Indonesia and Australia are probably at, at its best uh, since over a decade. But the issue starts to emerge, I think, when Australia and Indonesia have different conceptions of regional order. Uh, I think Australia's views on China is certainly not all shared by Indonesia as well and vice versa. So his questions that are broader than the bilateral side uh, that I think will have an effect on the bilateral side. Uh, the worry, of course, is that for Jokowi, G20 is not just an eco economic summit, but it is a platform by which to promote Indonesia as an investment destination, which is why G20 is such a big deal in Indonesia. Uh, all the preparations in Bali have been ongoing. And in fact, most of the agenda is about that side of the investment. So I think this is where Indonesia needs to step up Indonesia needs to change its outlook of seeing G20 as just another venue to get investors to Indonesia and see it as a genuine tool to shape regional and global economic order uh, uh, to, to benefit of all and, and not just to Indonesia. And this is where I think we miss a big, uh, a huge opportunity at the beginning of the invasion where we could have uh, stated our principles much more strongly, which would allow us to have some capital and some room to discuss how we can negotiate so that under Indonesia's chairmanship, the G20 does not become G19 or even worse, G10. Yeah, and I think there's an even bigger concern, yeah, that it, as you say, it might go the way of G10 or basically split along lines between the West and the rest or, or rich countries and poor countries. It almost harks back to the, the Cold War, uh, which, which is quite concerning on, on some levels. But, but I do think, Natasha, I wanna come to you on this question next. You know, despite what Evan says about the bilateral relationship kind of being stronger than these broader questions, there is going to be a growing tension, it seems to me here, because the world is dividing into blocks. And we've seen you know, increasingly strong language from, from the Australian leadership in the US and in, in the UK and Europe, talking about things like an arc of autocracy or some sort of deep battle between democracies and autocracies. I mean, what's your sense, Natasha, of, you know, whether Western leaders are thinking about how this plays in places like Indonesia. And from your reading of the data, you know, what does, what does the poll tell us about how Indonesians feel about this kind of division of the world into blocks and where they might stand? Okay, I think we may have lost Natasha for now, but uh, yeah, Evan, I'll maybe throw that question back to you uh, if you heard it. Um, yeah, how, how do Indonesians feel about the division of world into, into blocks? And do you worry that all this kind of rhetoric about arc of autocracy, et cetera, um, is gonna leave Indonesia and other Southeast Asian and developing countries pretty cold? So uh, this is an interesting question because I think um, I'll piggybacking on what Lina was saying, a part of the debate in the elites uh, and the public in Indonesia is that uh, the more the West uh, tries to promote their version of things, the more it is seen as, well, we don't want to condemn Russia because uh, that would just mean that we are on the same camp with the West. So the anti-Western undertones, I think does play a role on how we look at uh, this issue. Secondly, I understand that for the purposes of what's going on in, in Ukraine, that there needs to be a narrative that this is a mortal death battle between democracy and autocracy. But a lot of uh, people in Indonesia actually don't see it that way. It is not about a, the superior type of regime over the other. It is about a particular set of interests, whether that interest is about NATO expansion, whether that interest is about historical revisionism. Uh, but, the, but the issue is essentially not whether or not you're a democracy versus autocracy, because otherwise, one of the first places to invade would probably be somewhere in the Middle East. 
Um, so for me, the issue isn't so much about regime type, uh, but it's to what extent uh, can these conflicts be seen as accommodating both interests and values. And this is where I think the values-based approach to framing uh, the global rivalry uh, is not very resonant inside Indonesia, I think. And, and one thing that fascinates me is that our polls show that the Indonesian people actually weren't very familiar with the, the Bebastan Active uh, free and independent um, foreign policy approach, uh, which has been there since, since Indonesia's independence. Only a quarter of people knew what it was. Um, but actually what, what the data show is that people feel kind of that sense of neutrality and, and non-alignment, and they share the government's view. So when we ask people in the event of a US-China conflict, uh, what should Indonesia do? Should it you know, side with the US, side with China, or stay neutral? 84%, 84% of people said neutral, and it was just 4% who would side with the US and 1.4% with China. Um, so that, that, I found that really striking and a lot of wariness across the, the survey towards both the US and China, although maybe quite a few indicators showing there's, there's rising concern about China and perhaps in response to its assertive policies in the region. Now, Lena, I wanna ask you a bit about why Indonesians feel like that. Obviously the government, um, and the people are at one in this sense of kind of neutrality and, and non-alignment. What's, what's, what's that about? Is that, is that about principles um, or is that about Indonesia's history? Why is Indonesia so committed? And it's really important to answer this question because I think there are many people in Washington, in Canberra and in Beijing who would actually like to try and pull Indonesia over to their side. So I think it's really important for them to understand just why Indonesians are so committed to this position of neutrality and non-alignment. Well, Ben, I think it's something that is very intrinsic, you know, very deep uh, inside the Indonesian um, population, Indonesian society uh, of the, uh, well, to some extent, it's also related, of course, to our um, history in the past that we were colonized uh, uh, for three and a half century and then plus the, with Japan at the time. So basically, basically, there's a strong nationalistic sentiment uh, that we don't want to be um, colonized again um, uh, by any uh, any major powers, um, those kind of um, stuff, basically. So, um, but of course, in terms of uh, when you ask whether it's a principal standpoint, um, to some extent, probably I don't really see it's a principle. It, it's because of the principle itself, but it's it's a pragmatic thing. It's because of the history, because of our culture, you know the lesson that we learn uh, from our history in the past. So it's it's just there. So when you ask people, do you know about the in independent or free and active doctrine? They will say definitely no. But in terms of gesture itself, I think it really reflects that we don't want a very strong um, presence because a strong presence major powers will um, definitely imply a kind of an in, uh, intention to intervene into our domestic affairs. And this is something that uh, none of the Indonesians would like to see. And, and Evan, if I could ask you a hypothetical, I mean, what, what would it take to change Indonesia's mind? I'm sure this is a question, again, a lot of people in, in Canberra, DC and Beijing are asking, but what might it take? Could you see anything, uh, you know, Chinese aggression or a Chinese sort of attack against an Indonesian fishing boat? Are there things that would potentially shift Indonesia's position um, to, to side with anyone, any outside power, do you think? And, and what might those things be? So if we uh, focus on the public opinion side of things, uh, what would it take to change that? Uh, for me, the main filter of external events is the domestic political elite. If the president or the military or the other authority figures present a particularly stark choices, I think that's where the public goes. But in terms of a specific scenario in which uh, that might change, it's a bit difficult because as Lena said, historically, uh, it's not just China, but also the United States that has sort of uh, meddled into uh, the domestic affairs of Indonesia. We still remember in the 1950s how the U.S. supported a regional rebellions who sought to uh, secede from Indonesia. So if, if we're talking about a future scenario, I cannot think of uh, something more stark other than um, a potential hostile takeover of Indonesian, um, let's say, islands or, you know, uh, natural gas or, or resource uh, facilities, uh, for example. In the event of a regional war involving the US and China, if let's say um, the Western side and China were to fight over who can get to the Taiwan Strait sooner, 
and therefore, uh, you know, attack uh, parts of Indonesian uh, um, uh, territory to secure uh, those um, airways and, 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 um, and airspace, that might shift public opinion, but it depends on who's the aggressor, because I think that's going to be the, the main uh, angle in which the domestic political elites can frame. If the Indonesian elites frame it as China as the aggressor or the US as the aggressor, uh, that's where a public opinion will shift. Thanks. Um, thanks, Evan. And I'm going to come to questions from the audience soon. We've got loads of good ones already, but keep them coming. But I want to come to you, Tash. I think you've, you've rejoined us, which is, which is great. Um, I wonder what this means for, for Australia, because Australia's position on, on China, but really its whole foreign policy alignment has shifted quite significantly in the last three or four years. Three or four years ago, Scott Morrison and other key leaders were talking about Australia not choosing uh, between its relationship with China as a key economic partner and the US as its uh, security alliance partner. And now Australia is kind of fully down with the kind of pushback against China, if not, if not leading it. But obviously we see Indonesia and probably quite a few other countries in Southeast Asia very wary about this. Even though they're concerned about China, uh, they're concerned about the US, they don't want to pick a side. I mean, do you think it, it's worrying for, for, for Canberra and for Australia that there seems to be a kind of strategic divergence taking place here. And it's one that we don't often see recognized in official statements where the Australian government likes to talk about the opposite, strategic convergence with Southeast Asia. And I think I've lost Natasha just at that very point uh, when I finished the question. So um, Lena, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll come to you uh, to answer that question. Um, do you think that, yeah, there is an issue, I guess, not just for Australia, but for the wider Western world, that the kind of full on pushback and balancing against China is going to potentially bring tensions to their relationships with, with Indonesia and other Asian nations who really don't want to have to choose. Well, I think, um, well, it's kind of a difficult because, um, well, I, I try to uh, put it back to the Indonesian context in this sense. Uh, I think that's quite a, a interesting um, finding that uh, there's quite alarming um, um, result where China is being seen as a more threatening country um, among, the, among, the, among the society, while the elites actually, um, uh, th there, is a, there has been a perception that the elite is actually getting closer uh, with China. I think to some extent, I would like to point out the, the point that the influx or the coming of China, uh, Chinese migrant workers, um, especially during the COVID-19 restriction, that really um, um, influenced, I think, the perception from uh, the majority of the public. Uh, because as you see in another result of the of polling uh, about the job protection um, as the, the, the most uh, uh, important priority for Indonesia. Uh, and also, I think the media coverage, uh, as much as Indonesia uh, is not a party uh, to the conflict in South China Sea, uh, um, China aggressiveness in, in Natuna, I think uh, that really uh, something that picked the attention of the Indonesian um, um, society, uh, the Indonesian uh, people that uh, they, they see um, China is uh, like more threatening to, to Indonesia. And to some extent, I think interestingly, I should also admit that the Hong Kong issue, uh, the way China treats uh, the Hong Kong issue is also influencing uh, some um, segment of the society in Indonesia, because there has been a strong pressure against the pro-democracy uh, group there. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, um, in terms of the investment, things like that, um, I think the elites are still quite um, strong, um, having a strong position on that. And Evan, I want to pick up this point of Chinese investment a bit further with, with you, because it strikes me across the poll that that President Jokowi actually comes out in line with Indonesian public opinion on many things, right? He's talked about wanting the foreign ministry to focus on economic diplomacy, and Indonesians seem to share his, his view that Kemlu, the foreign ministry, should in a way have limited aims, support economic development, protect Indonesians overseas, um, not wanting to choose sides. So on many issues, Jokowi is in line with public opinion. We can debate later who's following whom, but anyway, he's in line. But the one issue where he's really kind of out of line uh, or diverging from public opinion is on Chinese investment. And we know that during his time in office, there's been a you know, significant uh, turnover of really high profile Chinese projects like the Jakarta to Bandung high-speed railway, uh, lots of resources projects, 
uh, Luhut Panjaitan, his key investment minister. He's been a frequent visitor uh, to China, trying to, to, to attract other investors from China. But at the same time, when we asked Indonesians how they felt about investment from different countries, China was the country to which they were least favorable. Saudi Arabia was the most favorable, and I think Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, US, and Australia. Um, is there a bit of a risk here? Is there something of a political time bomb um, that Jokowi and in Indonesia more generally um, you know, seems to be uh, having deepening its economic ties with China, but Indonesians are still really skeptical or wary of Chinese investment? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, Indonesia's relationship with China is perhaps uh, the most polarizing foreign policy we have right now. Uh, the issue of Chinese investment is a lot more problematic politically uh, on the domestic scene compared to, let's say, investment from Australia or the United States. And this, I think, has to do with how the domestic elites often frame and criticize uh, Jokowi's uh, relationship with China. It, it is very easy to play the anti-communist card uh, domestically, for example, or even um, making it seem as if Jokowi is taking instructions from Beijing, because then it sort of become a domestically uh, politically contentious issue uh, um, because of the long history of anti-communism. And when you mix that with some in the um, elites who would like to paint, if you are pro-communist, you must be anti-Islam. That makes it even harder for Jokowi, I think, uh, to keep up with that type of high economic profile uh, engagement with China. So I think if you look at the trend, despite uh, uh, some of the more signature uh, projects like the high-speed rail, if you look at the totality of Chinese investments and economic cooperation with Indonesia, a lot more is actually not covered by the media. And this is precisely because of the concern that the more uh, the government highlights investment projects with China, the more the domestic political opponents of the president uh, would like to use it as a way to uh, uh, to paint the president as being too pro-China and therefore pro-communist and therefore anti-Islam. And that sequence of domestic political attacks is why uh, the relationship with China will always be uh, one of the most uh, domestically polarizing relationship we have. And it's interesting when you also break down kind of how that polarization occurs in Indonesia, because across our whole survey, we look for kind of variations in viewpoints, depending on gender, on age, rural versus urban um, income levels. And we actually found so much consensus among most questions and most answers. Uh, it didn't matter whether you're rich or poor, from the Kampung, from Jakarta, people had very similar views. Uh, but one of the areas where we did find some divergence was on attitudes to the US and China, to the two great powers, where we found that Muslims uh, were much more likely to be wary of both the US and China than non-Muslims. And also some of the, the Islamic political parties supporters, they were more likely to be wary of the US and China, say, than supporters of PDIP. What do you think is going on, on there, Evan? Do you have any sense of why Muslims would be more wary of both the US and China than non-Muslims? Uh, this is something that is actually a bit uh, hard to, to, uh, to analyze. We need uh, deeper research into this. But my sense, my impression of this is because there is a sense of the fact that despite um, us, uh, despite Muslims being the majority in Indonesia, they always feel like they are the victim of great power politics. And they're always trying to woo Indonesia one way or the other and then sacrifice uh, Muslims along the way. Uh, we can debate whether this is because of Israel-Palestine issues or whether this is something a lot more closer uh, to the Indonesian psyche itself. But I think that sense of great powers as you know, potentially doing Indonesia wrong, basically, um, is why there's a huge sense of distrust. And if we want to uh, tie it into, you know, if you want to cherry pick a historical example in 1965, a lot of people would still say that Muslims were also the victim of the attempted coup by uh, the Communist Party uh, at the time. So I think the sense of being the majority, but also being wronged by great powers is still pretty much still uh, within the Indonesian psyche. But this, I think, requires uh, much deeper data and much deeper analysis. This is just my impression, uh, um, uh, briefly. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. And yeah, sorry we've lost Natasha. She's been having some internet gremlins. Hopefully we'll get her back soon because I do have a number of questions from the audience for her. Uh, and as our polling expert, um, I will put them to her when hopefully she joins us. But first, I'm going to uh, pass on a question from Alexander Adifianto of RSIS in, in Singapore. Uh, 
Um, and I'll maybe ask uh, Lena first, and then Evan, if you have anything to add. So Alex asks, what do you think of the role of Indonesia's national education system in contributing to Indonesians' lack of IR or foreign policy awareness in this survey? Um, does its emphasis of nationalism in the education curriculum as reinforced in Pancasila, Indonesian language and other official history? Um, is it that that's not giving much space to IR? Is that what's contributing to this lack of awareness and some of the hyper nationalist rhetoric that we've seen? Well, I think it really depends on how, uh, which level of um, the education system that we are talking here. Uh, on the one hand, you, uh, we in Indonesia, we see a surge in terms of uh, the opening of international relations department in many universities in Indonesia. So indeed, on, on that particular um, side, we can actually see there's like actually a kind of an increasing interest on international, like studying about international relations, international studies, and so on and so forth. But um, I'm, I'm not really confident to say this, but I'm pretty sure that uh, at uh, lower than that, I mean, like in the elementary school up to high school, I don't think there is so much exposure on social sciences, um, particularly international relations. Um, most of the education system on that level still focusing on much more on science, things like that, instead of on, on, on IR issues. So I think, uh, uh, while on the other hand, uh, actually you see the, the young people, of course, because of the um, uh, advancement of social media, you know, te um, communication technology, things like that, they can pick up a lot of uh, international relations issues from social media, even from TikTok, for example. So they, they learn about IR from, from, from those media. So um, I think um, in terms of national education system, I'm not really sure how, how this can be a, actually a tool to um, um, inform uh, or um, mainstream um, um, people to, to understand more about international relations. Uh, because uh, there are other outlets, I think, how people pick up um, 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 IR issues. And what, what's, what's your sense, Evan? Do you think there is something about education or even yeah, the, the, the ideology, the Panchasila ideology that, that leaves people um, inward looking or less interested in, in the outside world? Or do you think that there are other factors at play? Uh, not necessarily about Panchasila for sure. Uh, I mean, in terms of the constitution and all that, we actually have a pretty internationalist outlook. Uh, in fact, one of the mandates of the constitution was that we fight for decolonization, right? So in that sense, we're not necessarily at a position where our constitution and Panchasila makes us very inward looking, but it's, it's more about how the regimes actually have, uh, um, have sort of meddled in how history is taught in schools. That's certainly a key factor. Uh, social science scholars would, would tell us that uh, during uh, Sohardo's rule, uh, social science, both as a field of study, but as well as a curriculum uh, standpoint, including history and the humanities were very much skewed towards serving a particular vision of Indonesia. Uh, and I think there's certainly something there uh, to be said uh, uh, regarding, you know, perhaps one of the more undertones of why we're so inward looking. But what the data actually also tells us is that, um, you know, it's not necessarily related to education because as you said, Ben, uh, across all different education levels, it's, it's, it's consistent. It's not like the more educated ones have a better view of IR versus the less educated ones. Uh, as you said, uh, the data is, is consistent on that. I think what's interesting for me is the exposure part. As Lina said, um, IR is actually one of the fastest growing majors in Indonesia. Uh, so by logic, there should be much more people who understand uh, uh, about the world, but and yet we don't. Um, so for me, this is a, an exposure question. Uh, to what extent you get your source of, of, of news regarding the world uh, from the media versus your, um, your authority figures and whether you travel or not. Uh, so for me, I think this is a much more important uh, key measurement. But of course, uh, there is something about uh, the education uh, that we need to talk about, but it's not the content itself, but it's how the regime uh, uh, would like to manipulate it or not, and whether or not we're allowed to think critically about what we are given. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. And on that point, Sandra Hamid has asked about 
Natasha's comments saying that you know, people's views on foreign policy do matter. Uh, and she's asking you know, how, we, how Natasha came to that conclusion. And did we ask about it in the survey? I think Natasha has got some internet issues, so I'm not sure she'll be able to rejoin us. Um, but I can, I can talk a bit about the survey because we did ask how closely people follow world affairs. Uh, and the, the answers were that there aren't many people who follow these issues very closely. Um, but when you look at other measures, like whether they know the world leaders we were asking about, for most of them, there was between 30 to 40 percent of people who, who didn't know who each of those individual leaders were, uh, less for some of them. Uh, but I think the flip side of that is obviously 60 percent or, or two thirds in many cases did know who those, those world leaders were. And I, and I guess my sense would be maybe similar to Natasha, just that public opinion does matter in a democracy because people vote. And politicians want to do popular things that get them elected. And they're aware of you know, the Overton window uh, of things that are possible that the public will accept. Of course, they want to influence public opinion to move that window in line with the things they want to do. Um, but I think politicians do care what people will accept. And I don't think it's a surprise or an accident that kind of Jokowi's view of the world and many Indonesian voters' views of the world are very similar. And I think that says something about Jokowi's leadership, but also how he's able to kind of instinctively pick up and respond um, to public opinion. Now, Evan, I know there's a big piece in Compass, uh, Indonesia's uh, a top quality newspaper today, kind of examining this question and you were talking them, to them about it as well. So what's your sense on, on sort of, I guess not just the, the cause of a, maybe a lack of interest in the outside world, but what can be done about it? I mean, you're, you and Lena are leading Indonesian think tank and foreign policy experts. I mean, what do you think uh, government, what do you think universities, think tanks should be doing in the media to try and get Indonesians um, to care more and understand more about the world? And I think that's a challenge that I guess think tanks and, and governments would have in many countries trying to keep people engaged. But what, what do you think the government should be doing and others too, all of us? Um, I think, first of all, uh, there's more short-term ones and then there are long-term ones. Short-term ones, I think certainly the foreign ministry needs to step up its public diplomacy. Uh, domestically towards uh, uh, its own people. Uh, certainly because of the pandemic, things have been uh, put on hold and all of that. But the fact that um, in our survey, we also show that uh, the military is seen as the better defender of Indonesia's strategic interests and not the foreign ministry also tells us something. Uh, the fact that we don't know about a free and active policy or that ASEAN is not the most important regional organization for Indonesia also tells us uh, uh, the fact that foreign policy concepts and issues are not something that's close to the Indonesian. So certainly, um, I believe the foreign ministry should do more in that sense in the short term. Uh, but the second long term part is the facilitation of international travel and education. I think this is key. Uh, sure, uh, over the last few years, there's been much more of that because of the endowment uh, from the Ministry of Finance for uh, scholarships, but we need more of those. We need uh, a, a much more open, much more uh, diverse uh, pool of, uh, uh, of scholarship applicants and certainly uh, from outside of Java as well. Uh, I think education and, and exposure is the key long-term one to increase uh, that sense of awareness. And this is not a, uh, a one-stop solution that's gonna be done uh, within uh, one regime or more. I think it's gonna take a multi-year effort. Okay, anything to add, Lena? Well, I absolutely agree with what Evan mentioned. I think um, the foreign ministry really need to uh, shape up really um, this public diplomacy. It's not, not only image making, but really translate what Indonesia's foreign policy is doing for the sake of the benefit of the people. Well, it's not always a direct connection, but really uh, frame it in a way that this really brings benefit for the, for the overall um, uh, national interests of, of the people itself. And of course, I think at the society level, um, the university think tanks, I think to gener generate more discussions, I think, of course, once again, uh, with the social media, we can easily um, uh, pick up the issues like in Russia and Ukraine uh, quite, um, quite um, uh, rapidly now. And then we uh, generate discussions internally, things like that, you know, that really um, help to um, make people really uh, look at international issues in more strategically uh, rather than only focusing on, on domestic issues. Because nowadays in global, a globalized world, I think everything is actually interconnected. 
the Russia-Ukraine crisis certainly bring impact to the uh, domestic conditions in Indonesia. Yeah, that, that's certainly true. Um, and that's a, that's a really important point. You know, Russia itself is geographically in Asia. It has a Pacific fleet. It has key relationships with quite a number of Asian countries as well. So I agree, um, you know, these things aren't ju just disconnected. We are part of a globalized world. And so it's important for all of us to understand more, more about those connections. Um, I wanna come back to you, Evan, with a question from Ahmad Sukasono. Um, he says he agrees with you on kind of, I guess maybe the frustration with uh, the inward looking approach um, and also um, you know, a lack of ambition maybe about the G20. But he wants to ask about Indonesians' selective attitudes to different um, Muslim issues or different issues relating to, to the global Muslim community. So from our survey, we see quite a high degree of concern about supporting um, statehood for Palestine, um, but a lot less concern um, about the condition of uh, Muslim Uyghurs in China or the situation affecting the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar and the refugee camps in Bangladesh. Um, what's behind that, Evan? Ahmad wants to know, why are um, Indonesians quite selective, even on these kind of religious related questions where people might think if Islam is more important in foreign policy, why do people care about Palestine, but not the Uyghurs? I think that's a good point. And uh, I think there are some things that our survey can reveal and there are more things that uh, it cannot. But if you look at the, uh, the questions as a whole, you actually see, as, as Lina mentioned earlier on, a very pragmatic um, and limited approach to measuring things that are important, particularly in terms of economic benefits. Um, so my sense is that, you know, Islam as, as, as a religion isn't particularly high in terms of foreign policy outlook. The economic stuff is a lot more higher, I think, which is why you see, you know, despite uh, uh, um, identifying as, as, as part of the Muslim world. It's not the top one, right? The top one is Southeast Asia and then uh, to democratic world. Um, despite that, uh, the OIC is not high on the list of important international institutions. Uh, it's the UN and ASEAN. Um, even on issues that are you know, within the realm of what we might consider as, as conflict resolution, um, issues with regards to Uyghur is not, is not top as well. So for me, um, it's, it's hard to conclude from that that Islam is seen as or, or should be seen as the primary driver of Indonesian foreign policy outlook. I think economic engagement is still one. And this actually ties in to the question about the Uyghurs, which is um, not every issue has the same set of domestic constituents in Indonesia. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more domestic constituents for Israel-Palestine uh, than there is for Uyghur. And certainly uh, when it comes to Uyghur, we have to consider the fact that China's engagement on this issue is a lot more proactive as well, uh, where there is no Israel engagement in Indonesia over Israel-Palestine. So uh, I think the variety of domestic stakeholders and interests also help explain why some issues get airwave and others do not. Uh, but in general, what the, the survey tells us is that Islam in itself is not or should not be the primary driver of Indonesian foreign policy and outlook. Thanks, Evan. And we've got a really good question from Dan Montgomery Hunt. Um, and he's asking really how much the government's outlook on foreign policy and Indonesia's place in the world is driven by the specific personality of the president, uh, Jokowi, and also the individual party chairs, particularly uh, Megawati Sukarnaputri of PDIP, the biggest party in Indonesia's parliament. Yeah, so how much of a factor are they, uh, Lina, do you think? And it, could we see a significant shift in Indonesia's kind of foreign policy outlook after 2024, presuming we end up with a different president, which I know is a bit of an open question right now? Well, I think for Indonesia's foreign policy, unfortunately, it's still very much shaped by the idiosyncratic uh, factor. So the leader really um, determine the, the cause of the foreign policy issue. So when you see, as I mentioned earlier, even like international forum that like G20 is only being framed um, up, up until now in, is being framed as a forum to gain more investment uh, for the country instead of looking at as a prestigious forum to actually um, uh, like international economic forum. Um, so um, I think in, in that sense, that really tells that 
because I think from the very beginning, we all know that jo President Jokowi is not really into uh, foreign policy, foreign affairs issue. Like he's more into uh, the domestic issues. And that really um, tells that the, the priority um, agenda of um, the actual one, although in the beginning of his presidency, he proposed the idea of global maritime forum, you know, uh, the global maritime fulcrum, things like that, you know. But at the end of the day, we see now uh, it's simply just direct. Uh, he just picked the things that it, that had they are having direct connections with the domestic needs, like protection of um, um, uh, migrant workers, you know, the, um, investment. Of course, that, that's a, the, the top priority. So. I think um, in that sense, um, that really um, the, the most important factor. In terms of the party itself, um, I think it's pretty much PDIP is very, I think, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 a kind of party that really looks into domestic um, issues more than the, more than the uh, foreign policy issues. Um, I don't know, Ifan might have a uh, different reading from me, but um, I think it's pretty much uh, the, the same uh, with, with the president. Um, yeah, I mean, Evan, what's, what's your sense? I mean, I, I mean, I might push back a bit personally against kind of Lena's characterization, because I, I, I wonder if the differences between SBY, say, and Jokowi are more stylistic than substantive, and whether that kind of those non-aligned settings and the desire to row between two reefs uh, to me, it seems that goes quite deep. And while Jokowi talks about, you know, having friends with benefits rather than uh, a thousand friends and no enemies, uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't look that different in concrete terms. All the so the style is a bit different. But what's your what's your take, Evan? I think what's different is the level of daily concern, right? Uh, I think, as you said, the the major undertones of Indonesian foreign policy in terms of not wanting to choose and all of that, I think, has been consistent. Uh, but the issue is whether or not the president himself on a daily basis cares about uh, a wide range of foreign policy issues and not just one out of many. And I think that makes a huge difference because the personal investment and political support of the president does tell us, us how far we can get in terms of our foreign policy outlook, in terms of our diplomacy, in terms of a range of creative uh, uh, means to address global problems and in the personal relationships uh, that's necessary for Indonesia's foreign policy to move forward. But if you have a president who takes a somewhat of a license fair attitude and, and only um, concerned when there's investment involved, the other things sort of not get taken care of. And, and that means we all have to rely on, on the existing foreign policy uh, system to pick up the slack. And as Lina said, we're not there yet. Uh, the foreign policy system, I think, is still in the process of trying to reform itself and, and try to be more institutionalized. So in that sense, I think I agree with Lina's overall argument that it is still very much dependent on the president uh, uh, and, and, and how whether or not uh, the next president in 2024 will be more or less concerned to a wide range of foreign policy issues rather than just one. In terms of political parties, um, yes, I agree with Lina that in general, most political parties don't have a foreign policy platform that's serious. Um, there's a few maybe... Uh, less than a dozen who I would consider uh, senior political party officials with strong handle of international affairs. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also an increasing number of political parties that engage in international engagement. Uh, uh, international party to party ties between Indonesia and China has been growing uh, in the past few years as well. So it remains to be seen. Uh, but for me, uh, the role of the political parties through the national parliament in terms of shaping foreign policy has not been as strong as we would like it to be. Uh, so yes, in this sense, we are all left with whether or not the president pays close attention on a daily basis for a wide range of foreign policy issues. And just moving on from that, just the last question before we run out of time, given you said you're saying you're both saying the personality matters. Uh, in terms of 2024, we know there's a bunch of governors from Jakarta and other parts of Java in, in the race. Maybe there'd be more domestic focus too, perhaps, because of their gubernatorial experience. And then we have the defense minister, Prabowo, potentially as a candidate. How, how, do, how Lena, do you think uh, Prabowo uh, might look at the world if he was to secure the presidency? How might he be different uh, from Jokowi if he was in the number one seat? Very difficult question. I don't know how to answer this, Ben. Well, I think uh, we might have to see. <laughs> 
the the real action, you know. Uh, I mean, like. I think he's quite comfortable with his current position as the defense minister, you know, um, and probably I, I, it, it really depends on uh, the people surrounding him. Uh, he might have a bigger, uh, the, the biggest say, of course, in foreign policy, uh, but in terms of focus, he might be a little bit more outward looking. This is just my prediction. I, I don't really know. But um, on the other hand, also, I don't think because of the domestic pressure, the domestic needs as well, uh, I think the majority of Indonesian population still want to see uh, the leader that really answers to the needs of the people rather than be, uh, enjoying uh, himself or herself uh, doing a lot of stuff um, outside the country, basically. And Evan, 50, in, in 15 or 20 seconds, Propoo presidency, what does it mean for foreign policy if it were to happen? I think we will see him travel more than Jokowi. I think he's more comfortable in his skin overseas with foreign dignitaries than he is domestically. Uh, so I think I would see uh, more activism, good or bad, we don't know, but I would uh, see uh, more activism of, um, of Indonesian foreign policy under Prabowo. Thanks. Thanks so much, Evan. And thanks so much, Nina. Thanks, Natasha, who unfortunately dropped off. And thanks, everyone, uh, for watching. A lot of people have been asking about where they can see the poll. Uh, go to the Lowy Institute website, lowyinstitute.org, and you can find it. It's all there in interactive form. You can print off the PDF, look through the data and draw your own conclusions. And we hope this is kind of the start of a more regular program of polling and, and research on Indonesia. Uh, but thanks again, everyone, for watching. And look me up when you come to London soon. Cheers and bye.